been a long couple of years, hasn't it? It feels like it's lasted a decade, and this, this pandemic stuff and, and everything that's kind of gone through that. And, and I don't know about you, but I think myself and other people, you just find that the, the rhythm of your life, whatever it was prior to March 2020, it, it just got upended. It just got thrown off. Maybe, maybe it got thrown off at work, and you know, obviously if you had kids in school, uh, just things you did with your family, all of that just got changed. Holiday rituals and traditions were just upended. People went through some of the, the, the natural rites of life, like birth and weddings and funerals, alone or, or without some of the key people in their lives. And, and in our spiritual walk and our church stuff, you know, the, the rhythms there have been thrown off. Ta- attendance patterns have, have changed Some serving opportunities were put on hold, and then they found that the volunteers changed and did some different things, and some people who already had an eye for the door said, well, well, that's a good time to go somewhere else or not go anywhere at all, and things just suddenly felt very different. And then here we are in the, coming towards the end of the summer, uh, at least the summer vacation season. And things are about to change. If you've got kids in school, you know, there's a whole rhythm now that goes along with that. And, and uh, maybe your kids have already started school or they start later this week. And now everything just feels like it's time to, to reset things, doesn't it? And so I thought we would take this month and we would, we would focus on that, on, on this idea of reset, of getting things back to some sense of normal. But here's the question, what's normal? In fact, what's not just normal, what's good? What should we be resetting things toward? What's that baseline that we should look at and say, that's what we need to be? If you've ever had a phone that acted up, you know, you just, there's a video, that keeps playing, keeps doing things, something won't go on, and what, what do you do? You just restart, right? You just turn it off and turn it back on again, and hopefully it'll do that. But sometimes you find that you just got all these apps and different things going along, and, and the phone just is always quirky. So what do they say to do? You know what you might want to do is a factory reset. Just take it all the way back to the factory origins, how it came out of that. And, and I see there kind of a parallel. You know, when following Jesus, we are offered all sorts of apps, in the sense of ideas and practices and habits, all good things intended to help us grow in our faith. But they can also sometimes clutter things up for us. They, they impact our motivations. You know, am I, am I doing this because I want to grow or am I doing this because somebody said this is what I'm supposed to do and I don't want to feel guilty for not doing something somebody else said I should do? And sometimes it feels like there are unreal, unreachable expectations, unproductive busyness. So how do we reset? Where do we go? What's that baseline look like for spiritual reset in our lives? What should we aim for? In a way, this this question was posed to Jesus. In the Gospel of Mark, we're told about a kind of an argument, a debate that was going on, and and it says in verse 28 of Mark 12, one of the teachers of the law came and he, and he heard them debating. And he noticed that Jesus had given them a good answer. So he decided to ask Jesus a question. Said, well, maybe this guy has some insight. He said, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Of course, he's not using words like baseline and reset and things like that. But he is asking Jesus a very important question that is good for us to consider. Of all the commands, and in the Mosaic Law, there was over 600 of them. Of all of those commands, where should I start? What should I, what should I focus on? What should I make priority? Everyone has their pet commands. Everyone says, this is, this is the most important one. So Jesus, what, what would you say? Where should I focus? Where should I put my energy? Because I don't have time for all 600, so <laughs> Where should I go? Jesus said, I'll give you one. 
The most important one is this. And he quotes from Deuteronomy. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And then he, then he goes, <laughs> I got another one for you. I'll, I'll give you one better. I'll take you another step. The second is love your neighbor as your Self. There is no commandment greater than these. Do you see it? You strip everything else away and you're left with loving God with your whole being and loving your neighbor the way you would want to be loved. So over the next four weeks, we're going to look at hitting reset on our love for God with our heart, our soul, mind, and strength, and and loving our neighbors. So this morning, let's begin with resetting our hearts, resetting the love of our hearts. You know, when the physical heart stops, we're we're familiar with the the concept, the idea, the practice of CPR, or, or using the defibrillator to get it going again. But sometimes, you know, sometimes the heart just gets out of a regular heartbeat. It has an irregular, I believe it's called an arrhythmia. In this case, one of the procedures sometimes used is called cardioversion, which uses quick, low-energy shocks to restore a regular heart rhythm. In a sense, it's a reset. It's like, boom, let's get it back. Now, the fact that you're here this morning or watching online tells me your heart, your spiritual heart for God has not stopped beating. But you may feel like things are a little out of whack, to use a deep theological term. Just out of whack, out of rhythm, not where they should be. I want you to know this. The great physician, the great physician wants to help heal and reset your love for him with your whole heart. First, what do we mean by heart when we say that? We're, in the New Testament and Old Testament, when that word, a word is used for heart, it's typically not referring to the organ within our chests that's beating and pushing blood to all the important places. It's most often used figuratively. And it, it can be seen as what well, someone's called the, the affective, not the effective, but a affective center of our being. That is the capacity for moral preference, the the choices that we desire. Not just the choices that we make, but the choices we want to make. As one scholar puts it, it's a desire producer that makes us tick. It's essentially our desire decisions that establish who we are, what we're going after, what our life is about. And it's these desires and the subsequent decisions that come from them that can get out of sync, out of rhythm with our Creator. So, is that happening for you today? Let's let's do a little diagnosis and talk about what some of the symptoms of, of a heart that is out of rhythm with God. What does that look like? Well, here are a few things to look for. One is that everything feels like disproportionate effort. That, that the effort it takes to accomplish it seems like, well, this is way more than I should be in this moment with what's going on. Now, let me illustrate you this with kind of an opposite thing. So uh, a few weeks ago, I uh, was out in California for a conference, stuck around for a few days, and uh, met up with a buddy of mine from high school. And uh, we, were, we had decided ahead of time we were going to go climb a mountain we had climbed 42 years ago. Now, you may not know how old I am, but 42 years ago, I was 19. And the, the mountain was Mount Baden Powell. It's named after the founder of the Boy Scouts. And there's, in fact, there's a little monument at the top of it. It's 9,400 feet in altitude. You start at about 6,600 feet. So you go about 3,000 feet up. There's 40 switchbacks. Up, up, up. You're just constantly going up all the way up. It's a, over four miles uh, of hiking each way. Now, let me tell you something. In 42 years, you can forget a lot. <laughs> like how tough someone was. Or just the fact that when you're 19, you're, you're like a little antelope. You're just bloop, 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 bloop. 
Not so much when you're almost 61. You know you're in trouble within the first tenth of a mile. The words out of your mouth are, whose idea was this? <laughs> now, I, I know I'm not an avid hiker, but I thought, you know, well, you know that saying, you, you know, I'm not as good as I once was, but I'm as good once as I ever was. That's a lie. <laughs> so we're working our way up the mountain, and we're taking our time, and, you, you know, it's starting to think, one, at one point, Paul said, are you okay? You're, you're very red in your face. Are you getting, are you all right? I'm fine, I'm fine. You know, we're going along, we're taking little breaks, <clears throat> but we got to this point. I'll show you, there's a picture of it, if you put that up there. So there's this little saddle here, and, and that's the summit, just at the top of the picture there just an eighth of a mile away at this point. I was done. I, mean, I, was, I was done. From that point, right about there, I told Paul, I said, I'm going to listen to my body. I'm going to be wise. And I'm not going to try and do... I mean, it's just probably just another couple hundred more feet of elevation. Not, not much more at all, if, if that. But I, I was done. I felt like I was in the death zone on Everest. You know, <laughs> tell my wife I love her. You guys go on. I, I, I was as spent as I had ever been in my life. And so then we, Paul said, well, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going on. You know, why don't you sit down? Let's say we well, had a little snack. I hadn't eaten anything since breakfast. And uh, so sit down and uh, sat in front of this tree. And just show this next picture. So this tree, as known as the Wally Waldron tree, it's a limber pine. It's, it's one of the oldest living things. It is the oldest living thing in the San Gabriel Mountains where we are. One of these two things is 1,500 years old in this picture. The other one just felt like it. But I sat down, and I got refreshed, and ate a little bit. Then I decided, I'm still, I just, I had very little energy. I said, well, I'm just going to go to this next tree. And then, okay, I made it. I'll go to this next tree. And the next thing you know, and I, I finally got to the top. You can show the picture. And Paul just happened to take this picture of me, you know, conquered the mountain there. Now, I share this with you. Not to say, hey, look at this mountain that I climbed, but to more tell you, this mountain climbed me and beat me up. And that's normal. There's some stuff going on in your life right now. It's got you whooped. That's not what we're talking about here when we're talking about disproportionate effort. If you go climb a mountain like that, it's going to take every. Even the people in best shape will say, that, that's a tough mountain. There's some stuff in your own life. You, maybe your marriage is just, it's just rough right now. Maybe things with your kids are difficult. Uh, maybe you're going through a grief. Uh, there's something going on, and it's taking everything out of you. That's probably normal. But you know you're in trouble when you can't walk across the street without wanting to faint. That says something's out of whack. That says something's wrong. And right now in your life, you just, everything is leaving you angry. Everything is, is making you, you just feel impatient. You're just, you're just frustrated and constant and just every little thing is, is just wearing you down. That's a sign your heart is out of rhythm with God. That can take a number of forms. It can be you're, you're, you're burnt out. But something is out of whack, and you need to bring it back in. Here's another sign that uh, there's some, some trouble for you, and that is your focus is always on yourself. You, you may be going through and saying, why is this happening to me? Or why isn't this happening to me? Why am I not getting what other people are getting? Why can't I achieve my goals? Why can't I do this? And everything is I, 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 me, me, me. That's all you can see is how everything is impacting you. You can't see anything from anybody else's perspective. What might be going on? That's another sign. Your heart is out of sync with God. Finally, there's just no joy present. There's no joy present in your life. Having joy doesn't mean you have an absence of problems. But joy is kind of like that 
that oil, that lubricant that can get in there. And you can go through stuff and you can go and your gears are grinding against each other, moving against each other, but it's okay because you, you see that there's fruit, you see that there's good, you see that there's light. You know life is still hard, but there's still joy. But if joy is gone, it could be a sign that your heart is out of whack, out of rhythm with God. And why is this important? The Proverbs tells us this, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Remember, it's the desire producer. It's that thing that comes out. So everything you want to do, everything you do comes from one's heart. So here's what he's saying. Guard your heart. That means that taking care of your heart requires intention. If you're going to take care of your physical heart, you're going to have to be intentional. You're going to have to have more Cheerios than, than donuts. You know, there's, there's things you got to do that, that are going to help your physical heart and, and things that you can do and you can engage in to help your spiritual heart. So how do we reset our heart for God? How do we reset the love that we are to have for God with everything? Colossians gives us a hint. It says, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So set your heart, first off, on the right things. Let's take a look at that word set. The Greek word for set means to seek. And we say things like this all the time. You know, uh, I had my heart set on fill in your blank. I had my heart set on steak tonight. I had my heart set on this vacation. I had my heart set on that new clothing. That, whatever it is, you say, I had my heart set on that. That's something I wanted. But if your heart is set on something, think about courting for a moment, that whole courting thing. If you've got your heart suddenly set on somebody, you say, oh, I, I, that, that's somebody I want to get to know. That's somebody I, I, I really I want to see if maybe I can love them. They can love me in turn. I've got my heart set on them. What are you, you going to do? You're going to go pine in the corner? Or are you going to take a little risk? Make an introduction? If we already know each other, start having some conversation, asking questions, getting to know one another, finding ways to spend time together. Because if you have your heart set on something, you will seek after it. You will move toward it. So, why on things above, though? Why are we supposed to seek things above? Jesus tells us, in the Sermon on the Mount, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Well, notice what he tells us here. The stuff of earth is perishable. Everything here is perishable, corruptible. Everything, everyone Nothing here on earth will ultimately satisfy you because nothing here can ultimately satisfy your spiritual heart. Our souls crave something the stuff of earth cannot give us. C.S. Lewis, the great apologist, speaking more about the idea of this as a proof for God or that there's something more here, says something, though, that I think still speaks to us. He says, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. The, the reason we, we set our hearts on things above is because that's what we were made for. And that's the stuff that can satisfy us. You think about the things that you wanted and that you got and how long it took before it went out the door in a garage sale or got left in a closet somewhere. That thing that you just had to have, this would be the thing that would make life wonderful. And then you needed something else. So let me ask you, I want you to just think about this for a moment. What do you have your heart set on? Here's a way to test that. 
Where does your mind wander when it can wander? Where does it wander to? Where does it stop and linger? Where do you keep going back to time and time again? You know, you just have some free time. You just have some, some time. Where does your heart and mind go to? That'll tell you what your heart is set on. Now, it, it may be what that thing represents to you. It may not be so much that thing itself, but what it represents. But that gives you a sense. Look at this psalm. This psalm one, first one, it's a beautiful psalm. It says, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. Now notice this progression. Stand or walk, stand, sit. This this movement towards being in this space and staying in this space. But whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Now this is an an aspirational aspect in this psalm. It calls us to reach for something deeper, truer, sweeter, stronger, why? Here's the thing we need to see. Here's something you need to recognize. That you aspire to that which you admire. You think, what does it aspire? That's something you move toward that you want. And you aspire to that which you admire. You move toward that which you hold in high value. Why do certain trends and fads suddenly take off? Because people see or hear something, they think, well, that's, that's pretty neat, that's pretty cool. I want to do that too. I want some of that. Now, some of them are, are silly or neutral. Some things are kind of positive. You know, some of our national parks have seen in the last decade far more attendance patterns than they, than they had in the years leading up to that since they were brought in. And a large part of that is because of social media. Things like YouTube. You know, you can go and watch strangers hike something, or you can see your friends hike something, and you say, oh, I want to do that. I want to go there. I want to see that. And you want to, you see that, and you want to be a part of it. You want some of that for yourself. But then there are such platforms, some like TikTok, where people post themselves doing stupid stuff, dangerous stuff, even cruel and criminal. Why? Well, because they admired the fact that somebody got their 15 seconds of fame and they want some of that fame for themselves. And the best way to get fame is to be extravagant, take it bigger and better than someone else. Be more outrageous. So what do you admire? That which is good? Or that which is not? The psalmist here warns against admiring that which is wicked and sinful and mocking of that which is good and pure. If if you're a Star Wars fan at all, particularly if it's animated shows and it's recent TV series, you may be familiar with the name Dave Filoni, who has overseen a a lot of that work. I don't know much about the guy. I don't know much about his worldview or anything, but he said something recently, or at one point, fairly profound. And I think he's speaking to fans who just really think Darth Vader, the big bad guy in a Star Wars thing, is just super cool. He says, stop thinking of the dark side as some pathway to power. That's the emperor lying to you. It's destructive. Darth Vader, he points out, is miserable. He lost everything. He has no one in his life, absolutely nothing, until his son comes back and says, I love you. Other than that, his life is a wreck. That's, this is what I really love here. This is what I catch that he's got onto this. That's not the way to live your life. I see a lot of adoration. I get that the bad guys are cool, but they are evil. You really don't want to be them. But yet so much in our society, so much in our culture, it's not just modern stuff, throughout the years, let's be like the big, bad, powerful bad guy. 
But Jesus offers another way. The way of turning the cheek. The way of picking up your cross. The way of serving rather than being served. Of washing feet rather than having your feet washed. That's what Jesus calls us to. The psalmist calls us here to delight in the law of the Lord. Why? So we can be like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. If you were to go to look at aerial videos of desert areas, whether you go to Israel or you can go out west, and find, just find a little green strip. You'll find a river stream that's just flowing through there. There may not be a lot there, but there's enough. But that's where the vegetation, everything else around that is barren rock. But here's this fertile ground. You see, in your life, in the midst of all the barrenness of this world, can actually have green life to it. It can actually feel like there is something alive rather than dead that is prospering within you. Now in Psalm 119, we get a little bit more detail of how to move forward. Psalm 119 is a fairly long one, but it has some interesting sections, and here's one of them. He says, how can a young person, or any person for that matter, stay on the path of purity, that is singularly pursuing God? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sit against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips, I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts. Consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Now, let's break this out. Let me give you three things real quick that you can do to reset your heart. First off, seek and hide. And we all know the game hide and seek. That's one of the first games you can pray, play with a with a small child. And it's a lot of fun because you can find them easily because they go hide and then they giggle until you find them. But anybody can do it. Well, we're talking here not hiding and then seeking, but seeking and then hiding. Go after something and bring it to your heart and hide it in your heart. Plant it in your heart. Let it take root in your heart so that your heart might align with God. We want to know God. We want to know his nature, his character, his will, and bring all that in and let it, let it begin to get our heart back into rhythm with his. We're called to recount and rejoice. What are we to recount? He says he's recounting God's word. He's thinking through God's word. He's, he's thinking about his truths, his promises, and then he's rejoicing over them. Giving yourself time, making time to recount the things out of the word of God and the promises that are there and his truths that are there for you, his grace that is demonstrated and, and explained and illustrated. Letting that stuff just sink in and rejoicing over it. And then to meditate and delight. Now meditation is a thing we've really lost here in the Western world. And we hear it sometimes and we think, well, that's, you know, sitting cross-legged on the floor going, oh. but to meditate means to simply just allow your mind to think through things. If you've ever taken a, a rock tumbler type of uh, little machine, you've taken some, some rocks and they're all kind of dirty and not very pretty at all, but you put them in there, and you put it on usually some kind of mixture and you just let that thing go and go and go for a day or two days and threes and it just keeps polishing them and cleaning them and stuff, then after a while you have something beautiful. And you might look at God's word and you say, I, I just see a bunch of jumbly rocks. I don't, I don't, this stuff doesn't make any sense to me. I'm not sure what I'm seeing here, what I'm reading here. But if you give yourself some time with it, just bit by bit and think it through and just let that stuff tumble around in your mind, in your heart, meditating on it, some beautiful jewels begin to appear. Truths that you can take into your life now, that you can apply to your relationships, that you can put into practice at work, that can bit by bit, but we are so busy, we don't know how to stop and be still and think. 
And that gets us in trouble. So he says, let's, let's stop and meditate and think about his word. Let your heart linger and reflect on who God is, his qualities, his, his teachings. Just let yourself exhale. We're so impressed with doing. And we forget to just be. And to be still and know that he is God. Now resetting your heart is to move back toward seeking him. Knowing him. His character, his word, his will. That's how you get your heart back in rhythm, is by seeking Him. It doesn't come overnight. This isn't going to be one of those moments. But bit by bit, bit by bit, you can find that peace. You can find strength. You can find joy. So this next few moments here, We're going to sing. We're going to literally sing, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. Because if we do that, things have a way of falling into place. And I just invite you, make that of your prayer. Just just as you sing it, think, God, this is what I want to do. I want to seek you first. Help me find you. I want to seek you. I want to hide you, your word in my heart. Help me, Father. And if during that time you want to come up and you want to pray at these steps like an altar, if you, you want to come and make a decision known or if you have questions, we invite you to do that. One way I, I want to invite you in this coming week, your, tomorrow watch for an email uh, just with a daily devotion Monday through Friday and a way to sign up to get them all the rest of the week. But let your heart get into the Word of God. Let your heart... Focus on him. Get to know him. Seek him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you right now that we have your word to speak to us. And with your word, we have your spirit to take your word and to help us see things there that we need to see. Help us, Father, to learn, to learn that you have what we are constantly looking for. We're looking for love in all the wrong places. We're looking for excitement, something to kind of get us through the next day. And our hearts are out of sync with you. But this morning, help us to begin to align with you, to walk with you, and step with you. Help us to seek you and your kingdom. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.